Welcome to We Are Libertarians. This is a special presentation. Ba -da -ba 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 -ba. That's my music. I, we, we can't afford music here, let's be honest. Uh, we are talking to Mr. Mark Rutherford. Uh, we are going to interview Mark. Uh, Welcome to We Are Libertarians. This is uh, a special episode of We Are Libertarians with Mr. Mark Rutherford. Mark is running for the national chair of the Libertarian National Committee, which is the National Party. And that is, uh, he's essentially, for those of you who are not familiar with the Libertarian Party or politics, that's the Reince Priebus, Debbie Wasserman Schultz counterpart in the Libertarian Party. Uh, that seat is currently being held by Nick Sarwak. Uh, Sarwak or Sarwark? Sarwark. Sarwark, okay. I always get that wrong, I'm sorry Nick. Uh, I'm sure he's listening. So, um, and, and if he is, he's invited to come on the program as well. Uh, we'd like to talk to all the candidates for national chair, of which there, I believe, are three. Three, three that I know of. Okay. Uh, Mark is here in Indiana, as am I. Mark has been, and this is the disclosure portion, I support Mark. Mark is a friend. Mark has helped me uh, along the way in my career at various uh, points. And I, if I were going to Orlando to be a delegate, I would vote for Mark Rutherford. But that's not, uh, uh, that's my endorsement, but that is not a directive from Dear Leader. You are free to make up your own mind based on the different candidates. But, you know, having the platform that we've built over the last four years, we want to bring you the information to make a good choice if you're going to be a delegate or if you are a member of the Libertarian Party uh, or thinking about becoming one, then we wanted to give you the information on the candidates running for national chair. So decided to start with Mark and, and uh, because he's here. <laughs> and uh, he asked, and uh, we were happy to oblige. So thank you for joining us. Chris, thanks Thanks for having me here. I mean, it's my uh, privilege and honor to be a part of the We Are Libertarians tonight. Yes, a returning champ. Uh, he, he was on once before to talk about the Libertarian National Campaign Committee. Yes, that was a lot, very fun and very interesting. So let's, let's talk a little bit about your background. Let's uh, talk about where you started. Uh, when did you first realize that you uh, might be, when was the first time you heard the word libertarian and associate with yourself? Well, um, it, it was a slow process. My father was with the Indianapolis News. He was a columnist with the Indianapolis News. And um, uh, this was in the 70s. He was doing, he was doing his column. And uh, he wrote about all different things about politics, but mostly his column was about freedom. He called it Freedom Watch. Mm -hmm. And it was in the Indianapolis News two to three times a week. It was in it for years and years and years, 70s, 80s. Uh, I believe it was in the early 90s that he retired. And so uh, it got a lot of play. But he picked up on this Libertarian Party starting, and he started writing about it. His column uh, was bits and pieces, and he would have little things about that. And that's when I first started learning about the Libertarian Party. Um, and then in uh, 1980, uh, on Wabash College, uh, some of my fraternity brothers picked up on Ed Clark for president and actually did a lot of volunteer work in Indiana, especially in Crawfordsville, Indiana, uh, for Ed Clark uh, and that campaign. I followed it. I thought it was very interesting. At that time, I was mostly concerned about registering for the draft. I was very much that registering for the draft was inappropriate, that the all-volunteer army is the best way to do things. I'd already was starting to read Milton Friedman and agreed with Milton Friedman that that's the way you should do things. And uh, unfortunately, they started with selective service. Uh, fortunately for me, I was aged out of it, that, so I've never had to register for a draft. Mitten, and, mittens, come here. This and, is a and dignified interview. You this never is a dignified interview. You've never We've got another guest here. Mitten <laughs> is actually a, a very, very fluffy guest. But you have, uh, yes. yeah, so sorry about that. I apologize. George Stephanopoulos would never have this. Oh, hey, no, no, but I'm not George Stephanopoulos. So, um, but uh, I was very active in that, and that's where I put most of my libertarian-esque stuff into. But, you know, once I get into law school and then being a young lawyer, you'd read about the Libertarian Party. And the nice thing was that in the late 1980s, early 1990s, um, Libertarian Marion County started running, uh, trying to get people on the ballot through petitioning, uh, had some successes with doing it. Um, and in 1992, Steve Dillon, a good friend of mine, got on the ballot for Secretary of State, and he was able to get the over 2% of the vote to get automatic ballot access for four years for the state of Indiana. Um, and I started to see more of it. My good friend Kurt San Angelo ran for Congress in 1996. Amazing thing, he bought the best bumper stickers possible. I still drive by intersections and see them on telephone poles and light and traffic signal pictures. As do he, I. Yeah. Yes, oh, you do too, uh -huh. you know exactly. That was 1996. And then uh, Harry Brown around 95, 96 was on 
uh, the local AB, uh, the leading uh, talk radio station uh, at the time it was on AM, now it's on FM called WIBC. And I found him, it's like, oh my gosh, this is just who I am. I understand him, I get him, it's good to hear somebody who is thinking about things the way that I'm thinking about when it comes to government and politicians. I've been active with the Republican Party somewhat. I was a deputy prosecutor uh, in Marion County. Uh, knew Gold, Steve Goldsmith, who was, later became mayor of Indianapolis, was my boss. Um, but it, it was becoming obvious that it wasn't a very good fit um, and that the Republican Party was going in ways that were very, very uncomfortable. Now, I understand the need for a big tent, but their big tent just didn't seem inclusive for people who believed in freedom and liberty and it was becoming more and more obvious. And then in 1998, I just took the plunge. Steve Dillon, my good friend, said, Mark, be the treasurer of my Secretary of State's campaign. Where, and we did it, and we had a great time. That's and how we, we always, got it again. That's how we always get you. We make you treasurer, or we get you some low-level you know, position, or make you campaign manager, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, you're running for chair. That's right, that's right, <laughs> that's right, exactly. That's how it happens, and that's what happened to me. But it was great, I became active. Uh, and the people you meet in the Libertarian Party, uh, as a whole, most of them, uh, are just wonderful people and they're great to be with, they're great not only to socialize with, but great to do hard work at changing things, especially when they're all looking to get people elected or appointed to office. When you're with that type of group, it's a lot of fun, they work together and you, you can measure your accomplishment. We have 19 people since 98 elected to partisan office in Indiana and we've got, I don't know if it's scores, but probably scores of people who've got elected to homeowners associations, to be appointed to zoning commissions, and when a libertarian is on zoning commission, most of them get everybody to follow the law, which means that's a lot better than it is without them following the law and, and hurting people's property rights more so than the law allows. So it, it, it's great to see that and to help people. I was uh, personally on the Help America Vote Act Commission, and I think I was partially selected just because of you know, your executive director, Brad Klopfenstein, and your work uh, previously on that previous commission, they the Brad did a great job on it, and so they wanted another Libertarian. That's right. It. And I was the swing vote. So I'm not surprised. It, it came down to, at one point, I made the decision, and I ended up siding with the Democrats, and the Republican Secretary of State looked at me and said, how could you? <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's they right, because they thought that you're just a Republican light. No, right. you, they learned the hard way that we have our strong values and, and principles. So... Where would you, let's talk about your libertarian purity. Show us your purity, Mark. How uh, pure are you? Are you an anarchist? Are you a minarchist? Uh, where, uh, how far down the rabbit hole would you say you've fallen? Those who are really close to me know where I'm at, and a lot of people who uh, don't like my pragmatic style would be very surprised what I'm at. I'm not going to tell you because it's not important. Mm -hmm. I'm running for chair of the National Party. I've got to work for the minarchists. I've got to work for the anarchists. I've got to work for the people who like limited government. I've got to, our coalition includes all types of people. Some like government more than others. Some like hate everything but think the drug war is an exception. Uh, some people think the drug war is not an exception, but have other things they think are exception to, to things. There are all different philosophies out there. But I'm looking to support anybody who who uh, fits into the world's smallest political quiz quadrant. I find that quiz to be very accurate about a libertarian's tendency. And if you fit in that quadrant, what I've observed is that we can keep the people interested to fit in there. We don't alienate them by saying, oh, you're not 100, 100 will go away. That we keep them around and they become 100, 100 in a few years. Because as they are around people that they like, they begin to understand it, it fits together, and they go, you know, I now get it. I've seen a lot of people on a lot of things on there. So sorry not to answer your question about that, but I don't want to alienate people. Typical politician. Yes, I am. No, I, I, <laughs> I understand it because there is a culture within the Libertarian Party that, it, you know, if you're not on a particular team, I think it's like any other political party. It's not to exclude them. It's just any group of humans get together and they want to bond with the ones that are most like them. Um, and, and is that culture that, that I've kind of outlined that I won't ask you to analyze, uh, but trust me, people, it's there. Is that why one of your slogans is inclusive? Yes. What, and you're just putting one of your values front and center. Why, why is that? Because we're too small to break up into the small little groups, and I see that happening all the time. Exclusivity is the killer of churches, it's the killer of organizations, it's the killer of small governments, it's the killer of large governments, it's the killer of corporations and small businesses and large businesses. You have to have everybody with a common goal, put those aside and work together to figure out how to get that common goal. If there's two of us trying to take down 
the bad parts of the United States government and change them, we're not going to succeed. We're not going to succeed with a thousand. But if we can get tens of thousands of people who pretty much agree with us anyway, but not fight about who's slightly better or who's more pure or less pure or less Republican or less Democrat or less whatever, then we're going to be successful. Uh, there are some issues out there that when I'm having fun with my friends, I'll joke about and I said, I can hardly wait until we get to the point where the Libertarian Party will divide in half into the two major parties over this one issue. <laughs> but we'll be running everything and everything will be better for everybody. So that's how you have to think about things. That we are a political party, you have to be a big tent, you have to bring all different types of people and the goal is to make things more libertarian. If anything I can do, whether in office as an appointed official, or getting people elected leads to making things a little more libertarian, that's the standard of success. That is how the Democrats and Republicans do it. They know how to change policy, how to change society and change culture. We got the, bad, the wrong people doing it, but they do it slowly. I've seen it over and over again. I see it in the criminal justice system. I see it in the civil courts. I see it in the legislature. You just kind of whittle a little bit away on the things that are important. And all of a sudden you look back and if you do it a little bit at a time, you go, my goodness, I can't believe that we won. It only took 15 years, but guess what? We got it done. Now, if you had gone out and said, we want it now, go away, we hate you, everybody, without the compelling arguments, developing the friendships, or maybe not friendships, but the trust that you are credible and you are trying to change things rationally, that without that, it's not going to happen. You just go in and, and you start throwing rocks. You start throwing, sticking sticks in people's eyes. It doesn't happen. Um, and when it does happen, it's usually a revolution and you have Cuba and those people have been under an awful system for 60, 70 years. They had a bad one beforehand, but they certainly did get a better one. So how do we, what are some specific things that you as chair can do to help change the culture in the party? Because I, I, I've been away from the party for about three years and I, I dip my toe back in the water and I go, ah, why am I doing this? <laughs> You know, and I think part of it is just you, um, is human nature, but what are some specific things that, that you as chair can do to help change some of the culture within the party that makes it more inclusive and more welcoming? Well, one thing you do is that you have to focus on candidates and getting people appointed because we don't have enough people to do that unless we are inclusive, then that won't work. If the focus is doing that, then people, even people who might disagree with some of the candidates that might be run out there, will understand that they are important and they're fine to do that. We get more volunteers, it gets larger, it gets better. It, it, it just gives you the mass that you need to get things changed and to get people elected. You need to have all the periodicals that we have have to focus on things such as getting people elected or appointed. And the good things that they do to make things more libertarian, that brings more people in. Other things you have to do is that the national office and its staff cannot be, and the officers, which has happened for, I would claim mostly for 40 years, can, uh, some have been good, some have not been so bad, but generally I think this is a truism. They have to be outwardly focused. They don't want things to come for them. They don't just sit back there and hope that Indiana or Ohio or Florida sends an article in them about what they're doing. They make the phone calls and they find out what really is going on. And it doesn't mean they're necessarily calling libertarians. They're calling other agencies, media, etc., to find out what is going on. You've got to have very strong data. Now, data isn't a data dump of who your members are. Now, that's important. But it's also including things like, who are the people out there who are voting, who are kind of like you? How do we reach out on that? We have to spend money on the infrastructure to identify those people. And then we have to go after those people. And the way you do that is through branding and through marketing. And you assist the states in getting that done. Now, I'm very big on letting the states do what they need to do because they know their areas way better than I do. But we have to make it so it's easier for the states to do what needs to be done, which is to develop strong organizations that they know how to govern their organizations and they know how to recruit candidates and they know how to support the candidates. Notice I didn't say anything about what type of libertarian candidates. It's everything about the organization and the functioning and the strength so that they can do it. I've got to tell you, uh, there, there are candidates who could do quite well probably in Pennsylvania who would just not even get attention in Wyoming and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But those states know that, but they have to have the basics to be able to do that. Quite frankly, there's an awful lot that needs to be done, but those are the things you start looking on. But one of the most important things to do is that you've got to get the attention of the national media. And you do that by being there, being active. You don't do it by just sitting in the office or just sitting in your home state. You have to go out 
and you have to uh, join the organizations that they belong to. You have to be at the events that they are. You have to roam the home halls of Congress and w so that they know who you are so that you get respect and that you do succeed in getting people to say, okay, you're okay, we'll put you on the newscast. And it starts slowly. You might get the crappiest weekend for the Sunday news shows. But if you're good, and I've done a lot of it, and I've done a lot of interviews, both TV and radio and other forms of media, then you get invited again. And before long, they go, well, this is interesting. They make this program interesting. Let's invite the Libertarian National Chair again. Mm -hmm. Those are what you have to do. Th there's a lot of things on the list and a lot of things to do. Yeah, that, absolutely. I think uh, there's one specific thing that stood out to me in Iowa this past year that really il illustrated a weakness that the Libertarian Party has that you kind of touched on, and I'd like you to, to, to answer uh, this, because I'd like to hear where you might go with it. Hillary Clinton was, uh, she found specific volunteers to basically be butlers for, uh, or guides for specific people in a precinct. They took the idea of precinct captains and put it on steroids and digital. I mean, their whole uh, website and their backend system was built on a sales database as opposed to campaign uh, software. And so what would happen is a, a volunteer would then target several, you know, maybe a dozen or 50 people in, in a certain caucus area and would make 30 phone calls before the caucus day. And instead of getting robocalls, they got that one person. So, yes. Hi, this is Chris. I'm calling you, Mark. I want to talk to you. Uh, and so you were able to develop a relationship. And politics is the people business. You've got to develop relationships. Uh, and this is just a, a magnificent way for the Clinton campaign to develop a relationship with a voter, convince them, show up on caucus night, say, hey, I noticed you haven't voted yet. Uh, is, do you need a ride to the polls? Do you need you know, a way to mobilize people. Now, the back end of that is um, th there's a lot of structure that goes into that. There's knowing who to target, how to target them, volunteer recruitment, but ultimately that is uh, a major driver. Uh, and, and that's what we're up against. We're up against that kind of muscle. So how do we as a libertarians, of which I am a member of the Libertarian Party and have no plans to, to, to quote unquote go home, to either one of the two parties, how do we start to overcome that data gap and overcome that kind of organizational muscle that the other two have at this moment? By doing the same thing. It's not that expensive in the long run, especially if you're a national organization. If you start doing it, people start giving you money to continue to do it. Um, it, it, it and it, we can do it, but we aren't. We mm -hmm. just aren't doing it, and we have to do that. It has to be encouraged. Part of that's training, letting people know how to do it. That's one thing a national party can do, is do more training on the practical things to get people elected. If I may, let me tell you about Marion County, Indianapolis, Indiana. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very strong Republican county. Probably still would be, but for a couple of people in the late 80s, early 1990s, who understood the value of databases. And they basically put the party, but my goodness, actually the Libertarian Party of Marion County, which was starting to get stronger and starting to run candidates could arguably have been stronger than the Democratic Party in Marion County. But these people knew that they had to identify and reach the voters, touch them, and to know who they were, and they spent a lot of time doing that. The organization that you talked about with Hillary Clinton is what they did. We can do the same thing, and we can get that done. The resources grow as you show people that you're worth giving money to. If what you do is not to do those basic functional things, people, maybe rightfully, won't give you the resources to get there. Um, but the end result was, and Chris, you know this since you live in the Indi Indianapolis, is that the dominant party now is the, arguably the Republican Party. The Republican Party is still very competitive, but the Democrats are now on top. And that happened because they understood that they need to reach their voters. And let me tell you another thing that libertarians have to understand. You do reach the voters. Uh, this was several years ago, and I knew the Democrats were going to do quite well in the municipal elections in Indianapolis. Why did I know that? Three o'clock in the afternoon, I get a call from Democratic Party headquarters um, asking if I needed a ride to the precinct. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what that means. In Indiana, you are either a Republican or a Democrat in the primary. You take a ballot and you're recorded. Everybody knows who you are. 
So I knew that at three o'clock that they had gotten everybody involved in the Democratic Party to the polls. And they were now going for the independents because I am a libertarian. I'm right. not a Republican or Democrat on the records. So they were now hitting independents knowing that probably the odds were that slightly more independents would vote for them than for Republicans. Right. That's what they do. That's great. Republicans don't do that in Marion County. I tell them all the time that that would make them successful. Our libertarians are getting better at that here, and I'm very proud of the libertarians across the nation are starting to figure that out. But you've got to push that. And you can push that through the periodicals of the National Party, through training, through leading by example. You just don't be happy that you've got a good philosophy and you talk about it a long time. Go ahead. Yeah. The Cato Institute does that extremely well. The Reason Foundation does that extremely well. Um, uh, Jacob Hornberger does that extremely well. There's all types of people who, from different perspectives of libertarian thought, who do it extremely well. Well, let them do that. Our job is a political party, and that's what we are. Chris, one thing that happens a lot is I talk to people who said that they left the Republican Party, or the Libertarian Party, that they left the Libertarian Party, and I go, why? I'll call people who haven't been around for 10 years and say, what would it take to get you to get acted again? And their thing is to become serious, to become a political party. I thought I was getting involved with the political party. I realized that I wasn't. If I wanted to become an academic fee supporter, and fee is a really wonderful group, then I've given my money and effort to them. So I left because the Libertarian Party wasn't what it said it was. Yeah, and that, in my time, in the four years that I was at the Libertarian Party of Indiana as the executive director, I never really found a compelling reason to give any more than $25 to the National Party. And it was because they spent that time focusing on membership lists and uh, ballot access in states where, like, I'm, I mean, I'm, I appreciate the people in Oklahoma, but sending $200,000 to them for ballot access, why, ballot access is important. But at the same time, so is getting candidates elected. Yes. Uh, there was also a, a period of time where they bought a, they bought a building, or the, leasing a building or something, and it just to me was so backwards because when you do pol politics for a living and you need data and you understand data and you have no idea where where libertarians are in the state of Indiana so therefore you can't tap into new people you're just all I'm being given by the national party is membership lists well that's great but that doesn't get me any new voters we can't win on libertarian votes alone Right. So, so some of the the priorities of the National Libertarian Party over the last however many years, at least since I've been involved the last eight, have just not seemed to connect with the realities of getting people elected. Right, and that's what I as chair would do, and it'll be a cultural change, which I think is starting to happen quite a bit from talking to other libertarians, and that is we are a political party. That's our niche. And whether we think the political party system is a good one or not, if we're going to change it, we've got to start being one to try to change it to what we may want 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. But we're not going to do that unless we start replacing Republicans and Democrats in office with our people. People who think like us, think how government should be or how little it should be and where it should be involved and where it shouldn't be involved. Right now the Republicans and Democrats focus is how do I get more power? How do I get more money to my cronies? How do I get this? How do I do this? Libertarians don't think that way. Now, some people say, well, that will be corrupted by being elected. Well, guess what? That happens, and we're going to have the failures. But if we don't start doing it, we won't have the successes either. I actually admire people who run for office or get appointed to office a lot as libertarians because they're willing to take the chance that they aren't corruptible and, and the chance that they might have their ethics compromised. We are the fighters. We're the ones taking the risk. It's really very, very comfortable to just sit uh, at, in a chair and pontificate about the way things should be. Um, but if you're in the trenches, and our hits will be people who just don't do a good job or turn out to be uh, ethically challenged, that will happen. Uh, but we're the warriors. We're the ones who are going to take those hits and get it changed. It, it's human nature. I mean, it, any group <laughs> where uh, one or where two or more gather, somebody's going to be trying to hit somebody, steal something, or lie, cheat their way to the top. I mean, that's just how it works. No. Yeah, uh, everybody knows that humans have frailties, and we know that. One of the beauties of a limited government is that we limit the frailties and the effect of frailties. Absolutely. So where do you come at? Where do you come down on prioritizing ballot access? As I mentioned, you know, two hundred thousand dollars in uh, Oklahoma. 
you know, we, we threw a, a tremendous, and when Oklahoma, quite frankly, has not carried through on the promises that they made uh, on their end to guarantee that seed money, uh, you know, we're, we're, we spend a tremendous amount of money uh, on ballot access. How do you prioritize that between getting people elected, or is it an and or choice? In my mind, there's a one pot of money, and there's only so much. We don't have a printing press. That's the way I look at it, too, and I also think that uh, you have to look at things globally. Um, and in politics, as in war, it's strategy. You don't fight every front. You fight the fronts that you think you can have victory and that you can stabilize it and be good at. I think the parties become very good and very successful at ballot access generally. But where it's weak is organizations to support that ballot access, candidates to support that ballot access. We have to do both. The way I do things, the way I see small businesses that I, that I represent as an attorney, is that they're strategic. They don't start McDonald's by having trying to set up 18,000 franchises. They start by they start by the McDonald's Brothers restaurant and make it into what they think it could be. People liked it, so they opened another one. 50 years later, now there's 18,000 of them. That's what you do, but you're also strategic. You just don't open up and schlock it up and say, okay, now we're going to have a, a, a restaurant here. Now you do it well, you do it right. You have the support crew. What I see for ballot access is that many states it's relatively easy and we keep doing that and supporting that. Uh, other states have good strong people in it who can get it even though there's a lot of difficulties and they're fighting the Republicans or Democrats who are trying to take it away. You keep supporting them, but there's only so much money involved on that. And you also have to make sure that if you get ballot access that you've also developed the affiliate that can support it and start running candidates, that means that you don't ever have to do that again. I am so proud of Indiana. Now there's a lot of states that do good work in the Libertarian Party, but I'm proud of Indiana because in 1994 we got help from National. Guess what? We haven't had help from National again to we get ballot access because those brilliant people like Rob Schufer, Barbara Borland, Joe Hopman, um, uh, Steve Dillon and others who were there made sure they had a strong enough affiliate, run a strong enough candidate that they could get the 2% and darn it, they did. And they had the nucleus to then get it done again in 98 by recruiting other people that were in here. So that is what you do and what you have to have. Where I see the National Party doing is they're continually repeating the, giving the money to the same areas, to the same states, and it's the same problem. Now, not every state is comparable on that. Uh, Illinois, I have to give an example, is they're dealing with, with corruption in the worst sense. It's not necessarily illegal corruption, but they get challenged every time on that. They came awful darn close with really good candidates um, uh, the last time that they ran statewide candidates. They've gone and they've also done some lawsuits as well. They've done a lot where they're getting very close to doing what needs to be done and we're seeing progress where I think they're very close to getting ballot access and then they're very strong because of all their hardships. They'll be able to, do, be, to take advantage of it and use it once they get it. But we do have states that we do know and you've mentioned Oklahoma which seems repeatedly is a huge pit where we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years and we keep doing it and doing it. Not very many candidates are run. Usually it's just president we get the ballot on. Um, and what for? Uh, what have we gotten from 50 ballots, of the president being on all 50 ballots? Did we get the magic media that we thought they did when the program was put out in the late 90s, which I thought was an excellent program, was a good idea to try? No, but you just don't make it in that it's like all we do. Sometimes you have to change your strategy. Lao Tzu, the art of war, you, 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 you're strategic. You don't hit every front. Um, if you study the Civil War of the United States, both sides understood that. Uh, one had a huge resource problem, the Confederates, but they lasted an awful long time dis despite that because they did that. They were actually were more strategic than they were. Uh, they did some awful, horrible things. We don't like blunt civil war, but right. the point is it's the strategy. It's the thinking to do it and not overextending yourself. Um, and I see the Libertarian Party being around for 40 years and um, my goodness, a lot of people are surprised it didn't do, hasn't done way better yet. We want to change that and I think I can help change that. Hey. So one of the problems that I, that I see in the party right now, um, it seems very anemic. It seems very, uh, you know, state parties that were once uh, very strong are now, you know, having less people at their convention than Henry County in Indiana is going to have at their county convention. 
Uh, you know, states aren't holding conventions, they're holding organizing meetings. Uh, there, there seems to be a glut of leadership in the party. We haven't retained leaders at the state level and at the local level. Um, you know, I I'm, I'm, would consider myself a P1. I'm somebody that is committed to the Libertarian Party, somebody who uh, is, you know, obviously somebody with some small level of influence in the Libertarian world. I honestly couldn't tell you the last time I've had a communication from the Libertarian Party. I couldn't tell you what's going on in the Libertarian Party. I couldn't tell you who its leadership are. There's, there's very little communication from the National Party down. And as a result, you know, somebody who was a, was a leader in the Libertarian Party and very active. Now, obviously, I had my personal issues, but, uh, you know, so this is a twofold question. Sure. Because I think they're related. How... How do you keep and recruit leaders? How do you keep that bench full? And how do you, how and what ways would you improve communication uh, with the membership? You constantly have to recruit new leaders. We, Chris, you've been a leader, still are a leader, and only in a different way now. Um, but you burn out. You have to have people to, to, when people inevitably burn out, they need a couple years to take off, and then they come back in as long as you're doing what they think you need to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also, we tend to just sit back and hope people come instead of recruiting them. One of the things that I did when I was state chair, Brad Klopfenstein was executive director, did a wonderful job at it, was find libertarians. We read the newspapers at the time, it was mostly newspapers, we didn't have the social media that we have now. Are those like blogs on paper? Yeah, they're kind of like blogs okay. on paper, yeah, they're kind of blogs on paper. Okay. And we would go out and call people, and we'd find them, and we'd say, I think you're a libertarian, why don't you run for office, it'll be fun, this is what we want you to accomplish, and they would do it. And they thought it was fun. If you act like a nonprofit advocacy center, people who want a political party are not going to stay. People who I've seen too many people who were leaders, did some good work, but then they got swatted down by the people who want us to be a nonprofit advocacy group. Quite frankly, I think nonprofit advocacy groups are very, very important. I love them to death. But that's what you are and that's what you should be. Go to it, don't be a part of a political party. It's round pegs and round holes, square pegs and square holes. And, and communication with, with membership, because you, you still have to, you know, even if you're not focusing on membership, you still have to let people know what's going on in your organization. Yes, you do, you do. Um, one thing that you constantly have to do, the Democrats or Republicans do this quite so well, and some other organizations do well, is that you constantly have emails going out, or you constantly have newsletters going out that basically say, this is what's going on. Now, um, we don't do this very well at all, but I know people who have no idea that we have a sitting judge, elected judge, in eastern, east central Indiana. Mm -hmm. Everybody in Indiana should know that by now, who's a libertarian, because that's constantly being told what the good she's doing. And she's acting like a good judge. You can report on lots of things about what she's doing, that she's a, a leading business person in the community. Um, that she's been the judge for, oh my goodness, I think she's about, she's unopposed this year, so 16 I, years. With, but, I think she's, yeah. she's going on her fifth term. She, I think it's fifth term, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll get into term limits in, in the next podcast, Mark, but I'm yeah. just saying, like, she's become an entrenched <laughs> politician at this point. Yes, yes, yes. I'm for term limits for staffers, not officials, but that's another conversation. <laughs> um, and... Um, uh, that's what you do. You have to get the word out. And, and here's the thing that I do know is everybody's busy. But if you send out one communication a month and you hit the wrong time of the month for a person who's very busy, you're going to lose them. Yeah. Most people who they are really invested in the organization, they are going to, um, <coughs> excuse me, they're not going to be upset. Well, let me, let me just say that if you're having a one-way conversation as an organization or as a brand, I mean, what... <laughs> what we have managed to do here at We Are Libertarians is have a conversation with our listeners. Right. And, and the Libertarian Party, it feels like a bad publication most of the time. You know, it's just not, not uh, effective. Yeah. So, uh, so <coughs> let's, me about that. I've got frog in my throat. Sure. Let's talk yeah. about experience. Mm -hmm. uh, one of your, you're running on, ex, what are your two catchphrases? Oh, 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 inclusive and effective. That's inclusive what I've been all my life. Okay, so effectiveness, we've, we've talked about ways you want to make us effective and ways mm -hmm. we want to be inclusive. Tell us some of your track record. I, I find the story of you as public defender the most interesting. Because here you are, a small government libertarian, 
running uh, the Public Defenders Commission here in Indiana. How did that come about, and what have you done on that commission? Uh, is that libertarian to be serving on that board? Even? Well, I think it's very libertarian to be serving on the board because the goal is to. Um, what would you rather have a Republican or Democrat on the board? Right. Um, the reason I'm appointed to that is that the governor, Governor Daniels, about nine years ago, had an opening. And he gets three appointees to the Indiana Public Defender Commission. He, by law, can only appoint two Republicans. And I'm a libertarian. We have ballot access. My, you, you look at my resume, and as his chief counsel said, Mark, there's no way anybody can say that you're not a libertarian. Look at all you've done as a libertarian, state chair, et cetera, et cetera. So the governor appointed me to a spot that usually had been held by a Democrat. So I'm there and I'm able to at least give it more of a libertarian flavor. I'm not going to change that commission because it has three appointees from the Supreme Court on it. The, the Chief Justice appoints them. I've got somebody from the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute appointed on there. We have two uh, uh, Indiana House members, two Indiana Senate members, the three gubernatorial appointments. You know, this is all different type of disparate views, but basically most of the appointees believe that public defender services are very important. And in my op opinion, they're very important in that they're a check on bad prosecution or too overly aggressive prosecution. And where it starts and where it gets bad is that poor people can't be defended adequately, then it gives prosecutors who don't have a good philosophy or who are not good uh, prosecutors for society, that it gives them the opportunity to start pr prosecuting more and more people who shouldn't be prosecuted. And that includes for all types of things that we don't believe should be prosecuted at all, that it's just a bad habit and bad habits are bad, but you shouldn't go to jail for them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's very important that I work with them and I figure out a way to make that happen. But I have opportunities, like I invite people. Actually, my predecessor is chairman, a uh, Democrat, but he's very intrigued by some libertarian ideas on uh, a public defender work and is actually working with some people to implement them in a small community in, in Texas. Actually, he's working with Cato Institute on it, all right? Well, guess what? If I'm a Republican or Democrat, when I heard about it, I might not have cared. No, I got him there at the meeting and said, explain what's going on. This is really great. Is this cool? And he did, and he has respect because he was my predecessor. Right. So that's how you change things and make things a little bit more libertarian. And that's the well, a big benefit of being on there, on that commission. It, it, it's, it, it's a huge commission. It's millions and millions of dollars uh, are, uh, are allocated by the commission to those counties that have huge, meet our standards for public de defender work. It's very, very important. Yeah, and I think the fact that you were chosen to be head of it by your own peers, people of, not of your own party, Correct. that says something. Well, it's been eight years, uh, 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 just a few months after I was appointed, I was elected chairman. I've been chairman for over eight years and been on the commission for, for about nine. Uh, I, I, I have another question about fundraising and data. Uh, I don't know if they still use something called Razor's Edge. Uh, when I was executive director and I was managing the state party, I would get spreadsheets of our members. And this is in the age of big data and databases and all this different software. And we struggled to uh, keep all that data straight. I struggled because I'm basically, uh, I I'm not good at basic administrative work. <laughs> and it, it's just crazy to me in, in 2016 that we're still using spreadsheets to transfer information between state and national and local parties uh, when you have they're obviously, voter vault's not in, in service in the Republican Party anymore. It's something else. The other two parties have a two-way system of their party membership and donors. We don't have that. Why would you keep Razor's Edge? How would you uh, go about fixing some of the technology? Our website is, I know, about to be replaced, thanks to Sam Goldstein uh, letting us know that. Uh, but... I've seen Civic CRM, I've seen Nation Builder, I've seen states adopt you know, their own solutions. Does there need to be a top-down solution so that there needs to be two-way communication? How would you fix the data problem of membership and fundraising in the Libertarian Party? Well, first I'd figure out what works. Libertarians are notorious for trying to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's plenty of programs out there to do this on. Second, Razor's Edge, when it was proposed, um, 
we did the best that we could with the information that we had. Um, and it was a very, very expensive uh, project. I actually even voted for it. This was a long time ago because it just seemed like better than what we had. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was that not enough due diligence had been done. And as chair, you're responsible for doing the due diligence on this and making sure of that. Um, soon after it was implemented, um, I knew somebody who did college fundraising. I said, I'm not sure what our systems should be, but everybody decided Razor's Edge was the one, and they were horrified. They went, oh my gosh, Mark, for this to work, you have to be the size of Harvard University, Princeton University, MIT, with donor bases like that, because it takes 20 to 30 staffers to make it work. You were told it's an excellent program? It is, but you better have 20 employees to make it be excellent. Right. So, But we've never gotten rid of it since then. And Mistakes happen. We've all had done things in our life where it wasn't the best thing to do, and we learned the hard way. With good intentions, actually the data may have suggested it was the right thing to do, but then it turned out not to be the right thing to do. Sure. But what you do is you change, you grow, you get better, you figure out how to get the new system that works. Yeah, we have to change our database system tremendously. Do we have two-way communication between the parties, the, the state affiliates and the, and the national party? Well, yeah, you do have to have some of that. But um, it doesn't have to be something that is just like 2,100 and Buck Rogers in the 28th century stuff. Well, uh, there's always been, a, you know, we want nationals data for our own use, but we don't want to give them Indiana's data. But why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we want to have two-way communication? And, and No, no, when I talk about two-way communication, I'm talking about the data software that goes back and forth to each other. Right. And, and you should be able to read it. But yeah, everybody should share. We're all in the same game together. Yeah, I don't know that that opinion is shared by a lot of people, but yes, I agree. Uh, yeah, which leads me to I think we need to address one of the elephants in the room with your candidacy, and that is Barr and Root. Uh, I came in at a time in two thousand and eight, and I thought Bob Barr was an excellent candidate at the time for us. I mean, I I knew about DOMA, but it, it wasn't something because I was a Republican that supported DOMA when I was just a wee little middle school, I was like, yeah, don't let those gays do anything. They're gross. But I didn't know any better, and I progressed, and now I have a totally different point of view, and I think, uh, I thought at the time that Bob Barr was the same. I don't know now. Uh, Wayne Root is uh, an excellent promoter, and had a certain place within the party, uh, and you were his vice chair candidate in 2010. Right. And that has kind of stuck you with some sort of, I don't know what. <laughs> yeah, I, I see that there, but I understand that's politics. I'm not offended by it. What I am offended by it is that the people who attack them are the people who are exclusive. They are the people that divide the party and send people out. I know Barb, Bob Barb fairly well. We had a wonderful opportunity to make him grow in libertarianism, but all these exclusive people kept attacking him, attacking him, attacking him, because he wasn't the 100-100 anarchist libertarian that they wanted. I am very offended about what happened with Bob Barr. That could have been a wonderful opportunity. Why did I like him better than the other candidates? Well, I actually liked all the candidates for different purposes, but I thought he was the one who could be more effective. Was his campaign as, go as well as I thought? No, but did it go fine? Yeah. Did they make mistakes? Well, what campaign hasn't? Who's perfect? Who are these people, these exclusive people that you know who I'm talking about, mm -hmm. who attack people who aren't sitting in their armchair saying, you ought to do this, you ought to do that, you ought to be an anarchist, you ought to be a minarchist, you ought to be that. Who are those people? They did it with Root as well. Root serves a promoter. Why do we offended by promoters? He was understanding libertarianism. And there were times that I disagreed with him many times. And, and as a promoter, he sometimes stuck a big foot in his mouth. It was huge. <laughs> yeah. But we, he was somebody who was, could be beneficial and was getting more and more libertarian. You drive him away, guess what? Well, maybe these people are idiots and their philosophy is idiotic too. And guess what? These exclusive people, and these are the same people when they get involved in churches, take a church of 10,000 and they become a church of 50 in 10 years. Right. I am tired of those people, and those people are the people that shouldn't be involved in the party. They're in the wrong place. If they think that the philosophy is so important and all you have to do is tell the philosophy to people, then start your nonprofit and do it. Actually, they might be successful. 
but where they are now, they're not successful. So how do you deal with that negative culture? I mean, how do you deal with those people directly? I mean, is it just a faction of, a, is it a small amount of people or is it a large faction of people and what you do about it? It's a small amount of people, but they're very vocal, they're very loud, and this is their priority. They are also the people who don't play well with others. I'm just going to be very blunt about it. John Hospers, the very first libertarian presidential candidate, first person to get on the ballot as a partisan libertarian in 1972, wrote a lot about it. And he said that there's a lot of people out there who are very vocal and they attack me. And if you know John Hospers, he was just like one, one shade to the right of anarchy. <laughs> right. And that's what he believed in. But he's saying, these people, they're not pragmatic. I want to get my beliefs instituted somehow. Mm -hmm. But these people won't play for me. They just throw stuff at me. They stick stuff at me. They throw sticks and stones at me. And he was the type of person, from what I've learned, uh, by the way, he was our very first gay, gay libertarian candidate, uh, openly, gay, uh, openly gay presidential candidate ever in the United States. Right. Um, uh, so he, and he was a philosophy professor. He understood sticks and stones, so it break my bones. But he was just flabbergasted by these attacks he got from people. Well, so we attack John Hospers, we attack Bob Barr. What does that tell you about some of these people? And here is what you do and what I've done in other organizations, quite frankly. Number one, I don't appoint them to committees. That's not being exclusive. I appoint people of all different stripes to committees because the most effective committee is the one that has different types of people in there. But what is the thing that they have all in common? They'll play well with others. They'll try to find common ground, and, and where they have common ground, they go, hip, hip, hooray, let's do that. We can do that. We'll be successful. Then maybe we can talk about these other things later and see if we can find common ground on that. That's what you do. You don't listen to them. If somebody isn't going to play, and by play I mean to argue, not argue with you, argue, well, heck, you have to argue a lot in committees and debate, but won't, if they're going to just stick eyes into you, you are not perfect, you are not my religion, then... You, you just, you don't put them on committees and you don't, I see so many times, and this is a big problem with the Libertarian Party, is a new group comes in and they say, oh, hey, I'm glad you're here. Why don't you be vice chair? They have known that person for 15 minutes. Mm. The vice chair should be somebody that they've worked with on three or four projects and they have an idea of how well they work and are they any good? Do they honor their promises? Is their work fairly good? Uh, are they too busy doing other things, etc.? Those are the things you do to have a strong organization is get the right people there. I, sometimes I'm too busy to take on a project. I say no. Right. But other people I've seen say yes and then they don't do it. That, that's, you just can't do that. Yeah, I think the risk of, of that conversation is people thinking that there's a certain strain because the way that that is taken is that listen, if you are from a certain state or you... It, libertarians are the worst with groupthink. Like, they think that if you're talking about one individual, then you must be talking about all the libertarians around that person when you're really just talking about that one person. Yes. I mean, so is there a litmus test or, I mean, is there just like, how do you, I, I don't want people to get the impression that there's whole groups of people that you look at and go, I want to exclude those people because that's the exact opposite of what you're trying to say. There are a few people that way and, and there are people who, who, but people change. They, they, sometimes you talk to them and you said, Messiah, I've done a lot of that. There are people that you know, Chris, and I won't tell you about, that I've told them that they needed to play well better with others, and guess what? They went, oh, I didn't realize that, and guess what? They're effective leaders now. Right. And I agree with some of them on priorities, and some I don't, but what I do agree with them is that they're effective and inclusive of other people, even when they disagree with it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so well, I know that it takes a, a village, uh, to quote uh, one candidate, yeah. um, I want to I want to wrap up with your time. A lot of these priorities are the same priorities you had when you were state chair of Indiana. Yes. Uh, and there, of course, was an executive director that was full time. Brad. Yes. Uh, there were a lot of great people involved in the party at that time that were helping. But under your leadership in the Libertarian Party of Indiana, what were some of the outcomes that came about while you were chair? Because I think it directly applies to what you could or would do as chair of the National Party. I would agree with that. This is the best indicator people have about what I would do as national chair. One is our media presence went from almost non-existent to quite a bit, depending on where we had strengths. Uh, the major market of Indianapolis, we began uh, being invited to radio shows, tele uh, some television interviews, getting respect, getting in the newspapers. Uh, that was a huge thing. Now, media has changed, but 
Facebook is just scattered all over the place. It's hard to target it. People are figuring out how to do it better than others. But the national TV stations, uh, they're still big. A lot of people still listen to them. That's what you have to conquer. I, I help do that and help conquer that. Um, I One thing that I was very proud of is how the board seemed to work well together. We had very few disputes that, that, that weren't able to be resolved. In fact, we had none mm. uh, that weren't able to. Mm. Uh, we all, different types of people came together to do that. One very successful thing is finding and recruiting and getting candidates that were good libertarians to run. A lot of them didn't know they were libertarians. A lot of them who ran, who were recruited, now are still active libertarians from back there. Um, uh, the, when I was there the, as state chair, our training improved tremendously. Uh, we had the uh, county chair's conference where we would bring in people from the state to explain the campaign finance laws. We went from just paying tons of our resources and money for campaign finance violations to almost having perfect records in about five years. That's a biggie when you shouldn't be spending your resources on campaign violations when it's silly stuff or it's stuff you should be able to figure out. Um, that it doesn't have a political bend to it. It's just because you didn't do it. We may not like it, but guess what? Your choice is do I spend money on not spending the hour to fill out this form and, and, and use good money that could go to media or to supporting a candidate? Or do I fill out this form and go, when I am governor of Indiana, there won't be this form. That's how you get rid of the form. You don't get rid of it by paying the state $250 fines, $1,000 fines for not filling it out correctly and on a timely basis. So it's things like that that you do that, that make you more serious. And you go out and so it's an outwardly focused. And I, you're going to run across people that you just, it just doesn't work out. But I'm very proud of the fact that it was very far and few between. And there was a lot of people who we had differences in philosophy on how you do something, but we respected certain areas. There was one person in Indiana who, who we don't, I actually, enjoy talking to this person quite a bit. They enjoy talking to me. We don't agree on some of the things on strategy, but this person's highly effective. So this person I'm constantly recommending to being on, on uh, uh, committees and stuff to get things done because this person does mm -hmm. do that. Right. And I'm very proud of that. And that was a huge part, I think, of my tenure as state chair is that we have all different types of people working together. As in a traditional episode, we give the, the last word here for you. We, we give you the floor. So you get to uh, self-promote. You get to talk about anything that we might have forgotten. Uh, so the floor is yours, Mark. Um, well, I forgot to talk about bacon. Um, <laughs> now anybody who knows me knows that I post a lot about bacon on my Facebook page, uh, my personal one. My personal one, I tend to stay from politics because guess what? I'm an inclusive person. I have a lot of people who follow it who are all different stripes and stuff. And, you know, they're there because I think they think I'm funny or kooky or whatever it is or they enjoy it. <laughs> they're good friends. I know a lot of people. I do have a political page, and that's where people go to find out what I'm saying politically. I've got some friends who are very strong other parties who love my political page, but they like my, how I, my perspective, and, and, and so that's important too, but I'm not boring the other people who don't want to, to deal with that at Was all. Was that a shot, Mark? Shot? What? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> I mix it all, man. Oh, you mix it all. You, you mix it all. Frankly, you need more memes. I need more memes. I need more memes. <laughs> this campaign can be fueled um, by memes. Yeah. Uh, but... but um, uh, that's a very important thing is just getting people involved and the world's smallest political quiz uh, that's there's no perfect metric that's a good metric if they take the test and I think that they're not trying to, to do what they're not I always tell people to answer truthfully there's no wrong answers you get a good idea where they are usually I'm not surprised where they land on that right I do want to mention that we do have here I hope you don't mind that okay. uh, Kat Miller my campaign manager is here if you're looking at the feed of it you'll see that she's the person who who uh, saved me when I had the the frog in my throat and got a glass of water for me. Thank you. And, and answered the door when uh, the, uh -huh. night, the night shift came in. That's right. That's right. So exactly. Thank you, Cat. You, You're serving the campaign and we are libertarians well. Um, and one last <laughs> thing is www.mwrutherford2016.com is my website. I have a partial resume there about what I have. You see a little bit more about me in there. Um, and always, of course, I have to do that. I'm a politician. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're on that web page, look at the donate button. Click it. It won't hurt you. Yeah, because it, it is expensive to run for this office, isn't it? No, it is. It's very expensive. It's tens yeah. of thousands of dollars. Yeah, and that, that is surprising. I think that's surprising to people, but, you know, the candidates that are running for national chair are spending in the, what is that, five figures? Yeah. Uh, high, not high five figures, but... No, but it's still five figures. Ten to thirty, would you yeah, say? Yeah, ten to thirty. Yeah, I mean, so that there is a, a need for your favorite national chair candidate to 
to be donated to. Yes. Uh, okay, so thank you for joining us, Mark. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I hope that uh, that people learn more about the candidates. I think this is an uh, definitely an underreported race, yet it is an important race if you are a Libertarian Party member. Uh, thank you for joining us. We uh, Thank you for joining us here on We Are Libertarians. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kat. And thank you, everyone, for listening. All right, Dan.